and a uh, beautiful day outside in Oklahoma and uh, we have got so many new faces today and I'll warn you you can be walking down the street and somebody will say I saw you on television so uh, we just trust that you enjoy the afternoon with us and uh, I guess that's about all I can say we're just glad you're here I know a lot of you have traveled from out of town so uh, we just like to make our welcome as special as we can for those of you joining us on television, of course, we thank you again for the privilege of coming into your home or your wherever you are. And we realize that a lot of our audience catch this program early in the morning. And uh, so we just trust that from here on, you'll have a good day. Again, we like to thank you for your letters and your prayers. We cannot do it without it. And uh, we just are always amazed at how many letters we get expressing that for the first time in your life you're understanding what the Bible is all about. And uh, we just praise the Lord for that. All right, now we're only going to make one announcement, and that is that we are in book 49 today. So those of you out on television, if you want to order today's program in video or a book or an audio cassette, you just request book 49, and uh, the girls will get it out to you. Also, if you're not getting our newsletter and you would like to, it's sent out free quarterly, you just drop us a note and uh, you'll get on our mailing list and always rest assured we share it with no one. Your name is safe in our computer. In fact, we haven't even hooked up to the internet because I don't want anything coming into our office that uh, could possibly uh, endanger our mailing list. All right. We're going to get right back to why we're here, and that is Bible study. We're going to search the Scriptures, comparing Scripture with Scripture. So those of you in the studio are already in Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to drop right in where we left off in our last program, and that is in verse 4. And uh, for a little bit of introductory comment, I started Hebrews chapter 6 with a statement sort of like this. I feel like I'm almost bungling into area that even angels fare to tread because this Hebrews chapter 6 has probably precipitated more questions in our mail and phone than almost any other portion of Scripture. It is a portion of Scripture I think that has been totally, totally twisted all out of shape. It has caused a lot of people to have fear that shouldn't and on the other hand we don't take away the fact that it is a warning to people who may be taking these things lightly. You remember uh, we used that word several programs back that we're, uh, we're warned not to take these things lightly. These things are serious business because we're dealing with eternity and we're dealing with the living God, as Hebrews puts it. All right, now you'll remember that back up there in chapter 5, several programs back, Paul was lamenting the fact that these Hebrews were still unable to teach others. They were still on the milk bottle. They were still, even like the Corinthian believers who were carnal, even though they were believers, but they had never matured or moved on. And so as you come into chapter 6 then, the word therefore is in response to that, that the admonition to these Hebrews is to move on. Don't stay back there in Christ's earthly ministry. Now again, I'm going to qualify. I'm going to keep repeating because that's what it takes, you know, that the book of Hebrews is indeed written first and foremost to Hebrews. But don't count the book out as being superfluous and as no importance to us. And it's just like the Old Testament, and I treat it more or less in that same vein. We don't throw the Old Testament away because it was written for the Jew nor do we cast off the book of Hebrews because it's addressed to the Jew. But on the other hand, to really get an understanding of what Paul is saying here, we have to realize that it is written to Jews. But as Paul writes to Jews, we as Gentiles can learn so much. In fact, I've stressed it over the years, Paul always writes his letters to believers. Paul never addresses one word to the unsaved world, always to the believer. But what's the end result? It reaches to the unsaved world. All right, so as we look at these verses now, keep those things in mind. It's written primarily to Jewish believers who had come out of Christ's earthly ministry. 
and they still are not able to comprehend Paul's gospel. And uh, so I think what the apostle is trying to do is show these people that his gospel is not something totally foreign, but that it came up through Judaism and uh, the Jewish people. All right, so we'll just uh, jump right in now at verse 4, where he has stated up in uh, verse 1 and 2 that they were to leave the words of Christ, in other words, his earthly ministry, and progress on. And uh, I think I made the illustration in our last program. It's much like when the scripture tells the young man and his bride to do what with their parents? What's the word? Leave, Leave them. Leave them. Leave father and mother and cling to your wife. And I made the analogy. That doesn't mean that they forsake them. That doesn't mean that they say, so long, mom, I'll never see you again because now I've got a bride. No, it only means that you cut the apron strings and that young couple now move on in their life and they begin to take on responsibilities that they never had when they were back home with their parents. And it's the same way spiritually. We have to keep moving on. We don't stay back there in the elementary things. God wants us to get into the deep things of Scripture because that's when it gets exciting. But you see, most Sunday school material is elementary because they try to direct everything to the person who knows nothing. And that's what it really amounts to. They're, they're just constantly rehashing things that are at the level of the person who knows almost nothing. Well, that isn't what God wants. He wants us to keep increasing in the knowledge of God. All right, now I think maybe we're ready for four. For Paul says it is impossible. Now, I'm going to break this down so that you pick up where the, the thought really goes on. For it says it is impossible, and then I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 6, to renew. You see that? Because after all, this is what we're going to look at. It's going to be impossible to renew them again. And in between, we're going to look at the things that make it impossible. Now, like I said, this is the area that I suppose angels fear to tread because there's so much confusion on these few verses here. Is it teaching that you can be saved and lost and saved and lost? No way. No way. On the other hand, is it saying that you're saved and you got nothing to worry about? No way. And so what we're going to look at is the possibility for people, as it says here in verse 4, who were enlightened. And we started to touch on it a little bit in our last program. We ran out of time. And they were enlightened and they tasted. Now, what does that mean? That they got a brief understanding. They tasted, but they never took it in and ingested it. And remember I gave the illustration of on a hot summer day, somebody comes along with some ice cold water. Are you going to sip it and taste it to see if it's okay? No, you're just going to guzzle it down. You know, I, when I was thinking of this last night, couldn't help but think of some of our soft drink commercials. My goodness, you know, they can guzzle that whole 12 ounce can in a matter of seconds. Well, you see, this is what God expects us to do with the gospel. Not just taste it, not just pick at it, but we're to just simply embrace it and just ingest it. And that's what a lot of people have never done. Oh, they've tasted it, they've picked at it, they've had a little bit of an enlightening, they've had an experience, but they were never saved. In fact, this reminds me, I didn't intend to do this, but it just comes to mind. I hadn't been on television too long here in Oklahoma, and I think it was probably in association with my teaching on Noah's Ark, where I'd made it so plain that once Noah and the family were in the ark, and God shut the door, that family was what? Safe. Nothing could jerk them back out of that ark. They were safe. They were in God's presence. They had nothing to fear. But on the same hand, or on the other hand, by the same token, I guess I should say, while they were a build in the ark, there must have been scores of people that helped Noah and those three sons build that humongous ark. 
And they probably labored years, crawling all over that humongous thing. But yet when judgment came, were they in the ark? No, they were outside. And they had labored, they had worked to build the ark, and yet lost. Well, the analogy, of course, is this is a lot of church people. They're active in the church, they work in the church, they sing in the choir, they cook in the kitchen, and they'll do this and they do that, but they have never entered into a real salvation. And so that's what we're talking about here. These people aren't just saved and lost, they're never saved. Well, about the same time, two phone calls came in. One was all upset. He said, Les, he said, am I hearing you right? He said, do you believe once saved, always saved? And I said, yes and no. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, for the person that's truly saved, yes, they're safe. They're set for eternity. But remember, there are a lot of people who are not truly saved. They've simply tasted. They have simply been enlightened without embracing it. And I said, they may make a profession of faith, they may walk the aisle, they may join the church, or other denominations may put them through the catechism and the communion rite, but they're never saved. And so then the world wonders, well, why are these people claiming to be Christians and they live worse than I do? Well, that's the pity of it all, see? Well, then uh, on the same program almost, at least about the same day, another call came in. And she said, now Les, she said, I don't know if I can agree with you. She said, a few years back, we had a pastor who had been our pastor for a few years, had a lovely wife and three kids. And all of a sudden, one day, he ran off with our church secretary and we've never seen him since. You mean he's still saved? And without even thinking, I said, he never was. <laughs> Now, I know I can't be that judgmental, but see, this is the way I look at these things. When people do things that you wonder, how can a believer behave like that? And God does nothing to bring them back. They were never saved in the first place. And remember, this is more. Now, I'm not saying this to make you doubt your own salvation, but on the other hand, it is a warning. Peter says, make your calling and election sure. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you really base your salvation on? And I get phone call after phone call. Les, how can I know that I'm saved? Well, I just ask a few pertinent questions. Do you love the Lord? Do you love His Word? Do you spend time in it day after day? Do you spend time in prayer every day? And then here's the kicker. Would you rather be with God's people on Saturday night or out there in some nightclub? Now that's pretty self-evident. And that's what being a believer determines. It just simply separates us from the chaff, see? All right, so we're going to look at this, and it's so scriptural, and I'm going to show you. So it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. They were made partakers. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, not by any stretch of the imagination, but once in a while I'll take a verb or a word and look it up. And this word partaker does not follow what Paul says, you have been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but a partaker was just someone called alongside to help. And uh, just that, just alongside, it didn't really envelop them. All right, now let's go back and see what the Scripture says. And let's go back to 1 Samuel. And we're going to look at King Saul. Now I know a lot of people, a lot of Sunday school writers, think that Saul is going to be in glory, that he was a believer. No, no. Saul is another one of the typical candidates that Hebrews 6 is talking about. He was enlightened. And he spent a period of time under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But it never registered. He ended up turning his back on everything. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Drop in at verse 6, honey. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. And you all know the story how that Samuel went and found Saul of the tribe of Benjamin, big, tall, good-looking fellow, and anointed him king. Verse 6. All got it? 
I try to wait until I see you all quit looking because, you know, the television audience reminds me I'm going too fast. Slow down. 1 Samuel, chapter 10, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord, and it's capitalized, so we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, thou shalt prophesy with him, and shalt be turned into another man. In other words, Saul's going to be different than he was before. Verse 7, And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All right, but now let's go on over to chapter 13, still in 1 Samuel. Let's go to chapter 13, verse 9. And here is just a little while later, and uh, he is told to wait for Samuel. And of course the enemy is approaching and Saul gets impatient. And he doesn't wait for Samuel. And he does something that he had no business doing. 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 9. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Did he have any business doing that? No, that was the job of the priest. But what's he doing? He's assuming his own importance. That's not spirit-led. He is acting in the flesh, see? All right, now then you come on down to verse 13. Now look what Samuel says when he gets there, and this has just been done, and Samuel says to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the command of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But because of Saul's rank disobedience, verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Because of one act of disobedience? Yes, because it showed that Saul was not really what he thought he was. All right, now then, let's see what happens as he moves on through his life, which of course uh, went quite a number of years. I think he reigned 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. And let's come on over to chapter 28, verse 7. Now, goodness sakes, even a novice in Scripture would know that this is something that a man of God would never do. And look what he does. 1 Samuel, Chapter 28, verse 7. Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. What's he looking for? Fortune teller, a soothsayer, see? Which was totally forbidden in Israel. He says, Find me a woman with a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And so you know what happened. He sought her out, wanted help to determine how he should handle things at hand, and so he thought the best way would be to bring up Samuel so he could talk to Samuel. Well, uh, I can't explain that situation, but we know that in some way or another Samuel appeared. But all right, now let's just come on over to see the end of this man who became a rebel. 31, still in 1 Samuel, chapter 31, and uh, let's just start for sake of time at verse 3. 1 Samuel 31, verse 3. Now, remember what's been happening. Oh, sure. First he was anointed king. He had the Spirit of God upon him. And then it wasn't long until he took things into his own hands that he shouldn't have done. Then he goes another step down, and instead of going to ask the things of God, he goes to a soothsayer, a fortune teller. And now here's his end. Chapter 31, verse 3. And the battle went sore against Saul. And the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. And then said Saul unto his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith. 
lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. After all, this is the king. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. What did he do? He committed suicide. That was his end. He committed suicide. And yet here is a man that began with the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at another individual in Scripture that everybody knows everything about, I think, probably as much as I do. Come all the way up now to the New Testament to John's Gospel. John's Gospel. Chapter 6. I'll let you guess who I'm going to talk about. Who is another apostate that ends up killing himself? Judas. Judas. Now, I'm not going to look up all the scriptures. I'm just going to look at the one in chapter 6. I think it's verse 70, honey. Yeah, chapter 6 of John, verse 70. Now, you all know the story of Judas. He was numbered with the twelve. You read Matthew chapter 10, and it lists the twelve disciples, and Judas Iscariot is in there. Now, for three years, what did Judas do? He played the role. The others never caught on that he was an unbeliever. They never caught on that he was a fake. I always say Judas is the, the most perfect example of a hypocrite in the whole human race. He played the hypocrite for three years, carried the money bag. That's how much they trusted him. And yet he was never part of them. He just simply played along. You say, well, where do you get that? All right, let's look. I, uh, John chapter 6, verse 70. And Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a demon? Well, he didn't just become a demon in the last month or so. He was one from the beginning. He was simply playing along. All right? Then verse 70, 71, And he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, Judas then becomes a good example of someone who was enlightened, he tasted, he was a part of the ministry, but what in finality did he do? He turned his back on it, and had nothing more to do with it, and betrayed the Savior. Oh, it's a horrible thing, but yes, it's possible. All right, now Paul gives us an example of one as well in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Now these aren't men that were at one time saved and totally in no, they were merely walking on the outside. They had never really partaken of the things of God. All right, it's Colossians chapter 4. And you can just drop down to verse 11, so we pick up the flow. Paul is just rehearsing the men that have been working with him. Come down to verse 12, and Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now verse 13, Paul says, I bear him record, that is Epaphras, I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you, and for those that are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Now he continued... He continues on. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. In other words, they were in his traveling party. They were working with Paul in his evangelistic endeavor. All right, now let's go over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. And what a sad, sad Commentary. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. 
And let's just again, for sake of picking up the flow, go up to verse 8. And of course here, Paul now realizes that his life is coming to an end. He will shortly be martyred and his ministry is over. And so he's writing to Timothy, his farewell letter, you might say. And uh, up in verse 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give thee at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them who love his appearing. Do thy diligence, he's, remember he's writing to Timothy, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now verse 10, for Demas, the same one he referred to back there in, uh, in Colossians, for Demas has what? Forsaken me. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed unto Thessalonica. And so, yes, this is very, very possible that someone can be enlightened. Now back to Hebrews for the minute or two we've got left. And so it's so possible, whether it's an Old Testament economy or whether it's in Christ's earthly ministry or whether it's now during this age of grace, we've had instances of people who were enlightened, they tasted, they went along with, but they never embraced it. All right, I guess we could look at it this way. How about people today that have gone through that same kind of a situation? Well. It's just like the parable that the Lord gave with the sower, and we touched on that in our last program. Some fell on rocky ground, only had a little bit of topsoil. What happened? Sprung up. But as soon as the noonday sun hit it, what happened? It died, and it never mounted anything. Some fell on thorny ground. We'll be looking at later in the next couple verses and nothing happened to it. It had no place to germinate. And some fell on hard until ground and the birds picked it up. But then only a small portion fell on fertile ground and was able to spring up and bring forth, as Jesus himself used the terminology, some fifty-fold, some a hundredfold. But there are many who were never truly believers. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.